Hey guys, what's going on? Welcome to this video where I'll be sharing my honest thoughts on the Canon AE-1, which is probably one of the best beginner film cameras out there. So as I always do in these sorts of videos, I'll be breaking down what I like and don't like about this camera, as well as share some sample photos to hopefully give you a better idea of whether this camera might be for you. So if you do enjoy this video, then please consider subscribing, and if you have any thoughts or questions, then feel free to leave a comment down below. So the Canon AE-1 is no doubt one of the most popular film cameras of all time. Since its release in 1976, it sold millions of units, making it a very loved camera among many people. I was actually gifted this camera a few years ago, but have been using it semi-regularly since, and it still gives me so much joy when I'm shooting with it. There is also another iteration to this camera called the Canon AE-1 program, but in this video I will just be focusing on the original, but to be honest there's not that much difference. So firstly, this camera is pretty straightforward to use, but it might take a little bit of time to get used to as it does have a fair bit of manual control. So what I mean by this is you have to set your ISO, shutter speed and aperture by yourself, and then use a light meter to determine whether you are exposed properly. But if that does scare you then don't worry because there is a partially automatic mode called aperture priority. All you have to do is set it to A on your lens and then you only have to worry about shutter speed and the ISO and the camera will do the rest for you. For the first two years of having this camera I left it on this mode the whole time and I never really had any issues. And up until last year I've realized that the whole time I've had this camera I've been using the light meter wrong and my photos still turned out fine. So don't worry if you can't work out all the settings straight away. I will be making a more in-depth guide on how to shoot 35mm soon, so keep an eye out for that one. So as I mentioned, it is an SLR camera, meaning you focus using the lens, looking through the viewfinder, so what you see is what you get in terms of composition. For those that never used a film camera before, this system is used on most entry-level digital cameras, so it's nice and easy to see exactly what you're composing. Personally, I do find the viewfinder a little hard to see what's in focus at times. It's definitely not a deal breaker, but it is something to be aware of. But once again, that's just a personal thing I have, and most people might not share that opinion. So in terms of lenses, this camera does use the FD mount, which has a lot of lens options out there, giving you a lot of choice depending on what focal length you prefer. In my case, I have the 24mm, the 50mm, and the 135mm, and they're all great options. But as a beginner, you'll probably find the 50mm is best suited to your needs, as it tends to cover most bases and acts as a halfway point between most lenses out there. And from what I've seen, most of the kits that are available on eBay and Facebook Marketplace tend to have a 50mm included as that's part of the original kit setup. So these lenses aren't the sharpest going around but for a beginner film photographer they're definitely good enough and they definitely do the job. And sharpness isn't everything and especially when you're shooting 35mm you kind of have to expect that sometimes. In saying that these lenses do have a lot of character about them and will really give you that vintage look if that's what you're after. I've used this camera in a lot of different scenarios and I'm always pleased with the results and the quality. So if you want to use flash on this camera, it does have a hot shoe mount allowing you to do so. As I mentioned in my Yashiki T3 video, I love using flash when I'm shooting 35mm. Especially if you're out at a party or somewhere where there's not much light available, having the option of using flash can be quite handy. Unfortunately, it's not built into the camera, so you will have to buy it separately, but they are pretty cheap and there's lots of flashes out there. In terms of weight and size, this camera is really compact and portable. It weighs just under 800 grams with the lens and the body, and I feel it's very evenly distributed. So if you plan on taking this camera traveling, then you'll have no issues taking this camera out all day. So this is pretty common with most 35mm cameras, as they're always pretty small, but it's still worth mentioning. It's obviously not pocket sized like a point and shoot camera, but can easily fit in any small bag. I've taken this camera on most overseas trips and I always find it's the camera I just have to bring as it works in every scenario. The best part about 35mm film cameras is they're so easy to document the day to day events and this camera does a great job of capturing just that. So in terms of price, I believe this camera is pretty affordable for what you get. Currently you can probably pick up a kit for around 200 to 300 Australian dollars with a body, couple lenses, a strap and maybe even a bag in some cases. They were obviously cheaper a few years ago but since then the prices have stagnated somewhat so it might be a really good time to invest into the system. I think as a beginner you're much better off looking at a camera in this price range compared to something a little bit more expensive and use that extra money to invest in film and process. For me personally, it's a camera that I never plan on getting rid of due to its sentimental value but also due to the fact that it is somewhat a stereotype of a film camera or film photography and I believe there is some interest in that. Then again, people do sell these fairly regularly so I'm sure you have no problem finding one for a good price. 
So just quickly, I'll list some of the minor features that I think are important to know either before buying or once it's in your hands. So this camera is fully battery operated. So if you don't have one, then this camera won't work at all. So make sure you have one available at all times. So it takes a six volt battery, which is a very common battery in most film cameras. You can find these in most camera shops and retailers for around $20 and they will last a few years. So being a 35mm camera, you're allowed 36 or 24 photos per roll. And on this camera, the shot count goes upwards. So that's just something to be aware of. But if you do forget, which I always do, once you finish the roll, the camera won't allow you to advance any further. And then you know the roll is done. Sometimes, however, the shot count does go above that, which is fairly normal, but anything more than that, and there might be a problem. I once shot a roll which got to 42 on the shot count, which shouldn't really happen. So I opened the back up and I realized the film hadn't gone through at all. So essentially I shot a blank roll with no photos. This does happen occasionally, and it's so painful when it does but there are ways out there to hopefully minimize these issues with one of them being making sure your film's loaded properly like most cameras it does also have a tripod socket so if you do enjoy long exposure photography nighttime photography or self-portraiture then this will come in handy at some point point. and in regards to the look of this camera there are two variants out there one being black and one being the silver finish at the end of the day it's not really a big deal as it's the exact same camera but it is still worth mentioning as some people will prefer one version over the other. To be honest, I think they're both pretty cool and you can't really go wrong no matter what style you go for. So I will also mention that these cameras have been out of production for 40 years, which is not always a bad thing, but it is something to think about when you are buying these sorts of cameras. As this camera is more targeted at beginners, it's safe to assume that these cameras have probably been trashed around over the years and not given the proper care that they deserve. One of the major things you should look out for is fungus on the lens, which is pretty common with these older setups. Although it can be fixed, if left untreated, it will get worse and worse and it will really impact your image quality. So just make sure when you are buying, you are avoiding the listings that have any of these sorts of problems associated with them. So in terms of major features, there's not a whole lot to it as at the end of the day, it is a consumer camera targeted at beginner or hobbyist photographers. It's not overly complex, which is very ideal for anyone looking to start film photography or photography in general. But in saying that, even if you are more than a beginner photographer, this camera is still a great choice and I would recommend it to anyone regardless of their experience level. As I said, I've had this camera for some time now and I always find myself using it in conjunction with some of the more advanced cameras that I have. Its manual controls might take some time to get used to, but once you've worked them all out, you can pretty much use any film camera from then on. It's definitely a step up from a point and shoot or disposable camera, but it's a great way to learn more about photography in a more hands-on way. There's a decent amount of lenses out there and I believe it's a camera that you could use forever without the need of wanting to upgrade. There's always going to be downsides like the viewfinder or the lens sharpness, but when the price is pretty reasonable, these can definitely be overlooked. So on screen, I've left a playlist with some of the other film camera reviews I've done, so feel free to check them out if you would like to. So I hope you did enjoy this video and consider subscribing if you did, but for now, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.